Some scholars have published an article claiming that top officials of the Chinese Communist Party are hiding a sinking ship plan, also known as the Ark of Doom plan, which was prepared in the early 1990s as an overseas escape route for the top CCP leaders after the collapse of the regime, and transferred up to 10 trillion USD in assets overseas for this purpose. But recently, the United States implemented a series of sanctions against Chinese officials. So is it still possible to implement the Communist Party's sinking ship plan? On July 16th, the New York Times reported that the U.S. was considering a travel ban on all members of the Communist Party and their families entering the country, and U.S. national security officials did not deny the claim. On July 9th, the U.S. Department of the Treasury announced on its official website that it had sanctioned the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region and Public Security Bureau and four CCP officials under the Global Magnitsky Act for involvement in serious human rights abuses against ethnic minorities in Xinjiang. The sanctioned officials include Chen Guanguao, the party secretary of the XUAR, Zhu Hailan, former deputy party secretary of the XUAR, Wang Mingshan, the current party secretary of the Xinjiang Public Security Bureau, and Hu Leon Jun, the former party secretary of the XPSB. The U.S. Executive Order 13818, based on the Global McGinsky Human Rights Accountability Act, will be blocking the property of persons involved in serious human rights abuse or corruption. The details of the sanctions include that all property and interests in the U.S. are controlled by U.S. persons, that the sanctioned person directly or indirectly owns, or owns more than 50% of, will be frozen by the Treasury Department and reported to the Office of Foreign Assets. These assets may not be transferred or donated unless specifically permitted by the Treasury Department. The sanctioned officials will also be blocked from doing business with U.S. entities operating anywhere around the world. On the same day, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo also issued a statement saying that the four individuals and their families are also on the State Department's sanctions list and that they will not be eligible for visas to enter the U.S. Pompeo also mentioned that he was imposing similar visa sanctions on other officials of the Chinese Communist Party. Previously on June 10th, U.S. Congress released a National Security Strategy Report that talked about sanctions against Beijing officials, including officials responsible for instituting and enforcing China's new security law, targeting Hong Kong's autonomy and those behind the CCP's United Front Work Department. Even high-level officials such as Han Zhang and Wang Yang, who are members of the CCP's Politburo Standing Committee, can also be sanctioned. According to a Facebook post signed by Da Shiren, the sinking ship plan originated before the June 4th Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989, when the prominent CCP leader, Deng Xiaoping, made preparations for the June 4th crackdown, he created a plan B in case the crackdown failed. Several planes parked at Xishan Airport would be ready to fly west to Pakistan at any time, with gold and U.S. currency on board. Of course, with the success of the crackdown, this escape plan was not executed. But Deng's actions at the time aroused the discontent of other high-ranking officials such as Chen Yun and Bo Yibo. The officials knew very well that the Communist Party, which had killed as many as 80 million people since it seized power in 1949 through its anti-rightist and Great Leap Forward political campaigns, would sooner or later be rejected by the people and brought to justice. In particular, on Christmas Day 1989, the Romanian dictators, Mr. and Mrs. Sosescu, were executed, and many commented that this event frightened the senior leaders of the Chinese Communist Party. Immediately afterwards, on Christmas Day 1991, the Soviet Union suddenly collapsed. As a result, senior leaders raised the need to prepare a preemptive response to the collapse of the CCP and criticized Deng's selfish action. To quell the criticism, Deng proposed a sinking ship plan at the 1991 Standing Committee of the Central Advisory Committee, which was unanimously approved. After the meeting, a secret preparatory group was formed, accountable only to the CAC Standing Committee. Since then, the CCP has continued to raise funds for the plan and has used various means to transfer assets overseas in preparation if the party was going to go down. Beijing scholar Chen Yang Miao wrote in a Hong Kong media in November 2016 that the main idea of the sinking ship project formulated by the elite of the CCP is to squeeze the surplus of society in a kill the goose that lays the golden egg manner and use the money obtained from the people for themselves. 
Afterwards, they use various means to transfer their assets overseas, and once the day of the CPC's demise comes, immediately activate the archival self-destruction system to destroy all dangerous historical records, and then the elite families will escape overseas with ease, which will keep them and their offspring safe and rich. Ordinary Chinese citizens and their future generations, however, will remain trapped in a damaged society. The most critical step in the sinking ship scheme is to use any means necessary to transfer assets overseas. There are two main ways to do this. One, misinvoicing and money laundering, which is the primary way. Two, overseas investment or asset mergers and acquisitions, such as investment in the One Belt, One Road initiative. Chinese problem researcher Dr. Zhang Tianliang once conducted a study based on the Global Financial Integrity Organization's publication on October 27, 2012 in Economist, the UK's most prestigious economics magazine. The data inferred that the Chinese Communist Party has, in the past 20 years, used misinvoicing to transfer roughly $7.5 trillion in assets overseas. The Global Financial Integrity Organization compared the import and export amounts announced by China versus the total amount announced by countries doing trade with China. Theoretically, the two numbers should be consistent, yet they found a huge discrepancy. This money laundering method is called misinvoicing. For example, if I bought something for 1,000 USD and you gave me an invoice for 800 USD, then the remaining 200 USD you could directly deposit that in a foreign bank for me. In 2011 alone, the amount of money laundered in this way amounted to $430 billion. In 2011, China's official import and export total was $3.6 trillion. If so, the percentage of money laundered is 12% of the total amount. Using this method, the GFI organization found that from 2000 to 2011, the Chinese Communist Party laundered $3.2 trillion overseas. But that's not the only method of money laundering. GFI estimates that the CCP laundered a total of $3.79 trillion over those 11 years. Because the report was published in 2012, data after 2012 is not available. However, we have no reason to believe that the CCP suddenly became clean after 2012, so let's extrapolate by the same ratio. Since 2012, the CCP's total imports and exports have increased by an average of 6% per year, and let's assume that the percentage of money laundering has remained the same. That's the formula for summing up an equal ratio series, with a total of 8 years from 2012 to 2019, roughly another $4.255 trillion was laundered. Therefore, the Chinese Communist Party laundered about $7.5 trillion in the past 20 years, using the method of issuing fake invoices. With the addition of other money laundering channels, a total of $8.83 trillion was laundered. The second mode is overseas investment or asset mergers and acquisitions. Starting from 1999, the Chinese government launched the Go Global strategy to promote overseas investment on a large scale. For example, it has used the methods of capital transfer, such as the One Belt, One Road initiative, overseas direct investment projects, etc., to transfer assets. According to statistics published on the website of the Department of Foreign Investment and Economic Cooperation of the Ministry of Commerce of China, China's total outbound investment reached US$2.0933 trillion as of 2019. It has been investigated that many of China's overseas acquisitions have paid far more than the actual value of the projects. In particular, the One Belt, One Road initiative, led by Xi Jinping in 2013, not only fulfilled their ambition to control the world by dominating the world economy and political order, but also facilitated conditions for them to transfer their assets in the form of overseas investments. In total, the CCP has transferred as much as $10 trillion in assets overseas. In 2019, the U.S. GDP totaled $21.7 trillion, so the CCP's transfer of assets overseas is roughly half of the annual U.S. gross national product. Along with transferring assets, the CCP is also trying to ease relations between countries through foreign aid and other means in order to prepare places of refuge for the future. Why is it that China still has many people living in an extreme poverty and never allocates money for disasters such as earthquakes and floods, but instead throws money to Africa and South America? That may be the answer to this perplexing question.
According to a confidential 32,500-word internal Communist Party report previously revealed by Chinese magazine in Hong Kong, the CCP admits that the crisis has reached a tipping point and could collapse at any time, with more than 85% of its higher-ups ready to abandon their posts and flee. In recent years, China's experienced serious capital outflows. As early as 2010, the Chinese Academy of Sciences has revealed research data indicating that since the mid-1990s, the number of fleeing CCP officials are up to 16 to 18,000 people, fleeing with money amounting to 800 billion won, about 114 million USD. According to statistics, from 2009 to 2013, the average annual capital flight from China was 600 billion to 700 billion USD. In 2014, this number reached 800 billion to 900 billion USD, and in 2015, over 1 trillion USD flowed abroad. As exposed by WikiLeaks, corrupt officials in mainland China have more than 5,000 personal accounts in Swiss banks, two-thirds of whom are central-level officials, from the level of vice premier, bank governors, and ministers to central committee members, many of whom own Swiss accounts. In addition, most of the bureaucrats who have worked in Hong Kong also have Swiss bank accounts. In 2012, Hong Kong's Trend magazine cited a statistic from an internal Communist Party authority which revealed that 90% of Central Committee members, relatives, had immigrated overseas. Xin Ling, an expert on mainland China systems, revealed in an exclusive interview with the Epoch Times that before the 18th National Congress, a survey was conducted within the Communist Party. The survey found that more than 85% of the children and family of Central Committee members, Reserve Committee members, and members of the Central Commission for Discipline and Inspection had settled abroad, bought homes, and were preparing to abandon, ship, and flee. Lin Jie, a professor at the Chinese Communist Party School, revealed during the two sessions period in 2010, there were 1.18 million naked officials that appeared in the 10 years between 1995 and 2005. A naked official is a Chinese term that refers to any state employee whose spouse and children have all immigrated outside the country and possess overseas citizenship or residency. Some analysts say that once the U.S. takes action, all of the CCP's overseas funds will be frozen or even confiscated by the U.S., and the U.S. may also convince the EU, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the U.K., Japan, and other countries to freeze the CCP's overseas assets, putting the CCP officials' efforts in vain. Some other analysts believe that once the U.S. announces the assets of CCP officials and their families in the United States, it will trigger a massive response in China. That way, the CCP could really be facing a desperate situation, with public discontent inside and international pressure outside with nowhere to run. History has proven that extremist totalitarian regimes and organizations that commit crimes against humanity do not last long, and that goodwill always prevail and justice will be served. We will continue to provide in-depth coverage of China and give you another perspective on the country. If you are interested in our content, please subscribe to our channel. Thanks for tuning in.